I was living a life in a concrete jungle. It was weird. And that year, you know, like E.T. came out. I didn't see that in theaters. Oh, I, uh, oh, I you know I, what? I remember and, that and, as well. And uh, the, the one with um, Harrison Ford. I didn't see that in the theaters, too. <laughs> yeah, Blade Runner came out the same weekend. Yeah, I didn't see that. And those movies, I didn't see in the theaters. I waited until it came out on video. Yeah, E.T. Oh, came out like two weeks before. And it, it debuted at like number eight. It stayed in the top ten for three weeks, and then it dropped out into obscurity after that. Pretty much, but but home rental of video didn't really go mainstream until after the mid eighties, right? Well, yeah, roughly, yeah, yeah, roughly. Yeah, yeah, roughly you know. Maintained a cult following, and when it went to VHS and all that, and then later went to DVD, it just went. It skyrocketed from there. Um, so it's just scary. Yeah, this movie came out yeah, in eighty two, but. It didn't really see its proper due until way later with uh, VHS, DVD, and all that came out. Mm -hmm. um, the scary part is, I remember when I was first exposed to this movie, it, it just popped into my head last night. I was, I was at home for some reason. It was a school day. I was only like 11 years old. And we used to have a thing called the prize movie. It was on um, one of the local UHF channels. It was hosted by a guy named John Lanigan. He was one of the local big time radio disc jockeys and he'd come in every day and he did the prize movie where they'd show a movie, he'd pop up during the commercial <laughs> and he'd, you know, he'd, he'd get a caller on the line, they'd ask him a couple trivia questions and then blah blah blah, and then he'd you know either pick a lem pick a letter out of the thing or steal you know, or spin the wheel, quote unquote, and they'd win a prize. And then he showed it he showed up one of the clips from the movie, the thing. And it was the clip of the uh, scene in the uh, dog cage. Yeah. Ah. I remember that very vividly. Yeah, where you know, where you know they had the dog locked up in the cage with the others, and they come down, and then they they showed it all the way up through the part where the creature actually, you know, the big arms come flying out, and it yanks itself up to the ceiling, and that's where it faded out. And and, and you gotta love a movie like that where you can actually recall stuff like that going on. Oh my God, that was back in '82. So this had it. Oh man, I feel monstrously old. Now. <laughs> Thirty-three years. Yes. How much? Thirty-three years. Wow! Oh. My God! Yeah, it's, it's, gotta love a movie like that. Oh, by the way, we've been recording for the last couple of minutes. I thought wrong. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, man, nobody say. Luckily, nobody say no for Franny, so we're good to go. You know, I thought I couldn't get away with that anymore, especially with Zoom. Or <laughs> I didn't even oh, say it. <laughs> It's just tucked away in the corner going, hi. Oh, well. Anyway, to the movie. Oh, yeah. We need introduction first. Oh, dun, dun, dun. That's, Look at that, that's a nice t-shirt. I actually that's remember awesome. the t-shirt for this one because I have a Big Trouble in Little China t-shirt. And I forgot to wear it last week you know, for the, the Big Trouble in Little China cast. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Omega Files. I'm your host, Dr. Freedom. If you haven't figured that out by now, all well. Uh, we feel we've been running on the mouth at the mouth here for a couple minutes. Uh, this week we've gathered to talk about 1982, John Carpenter's The Thing. All right, let's go around. Let's get uh, intros from the cast. Let's start with AJ from Australia. How's it going, AJ? Hey guys, good. All right, all the way from New York, William. Hey now, how you doing, Freedom? And, and somewhere well out of Soho, Philip Archer. <gasps> Hi, girlfriend. No, I'm agree. <laughs> and joining us from somewhere also near New York, Brian, BJ. Hello, everybody. What's up? <laughs> and Tim from Texas will be back here in shortly. Uh, he's having a busy day there. So, okay. Um, John Carpenter's The Thing. Yeah, this thing came out, as we just said, the same weekend as Blade Runner. It also had, was less than two weeks after... E.T., the extraterrestrial hit. Uh, it debuted at number eight, stayed in the top ten for like two or three weeks, and then, of course, it, like all movies back then, it kind of faded off into nowhere. All right. Uh, oh, Tim's back with us. Uh, give us a greeting, Tim. Say hello from deep in the heart of Texas. Hello there. Okay. Well, since we got you back, starting with you. Um, no, you can't. <laughs> oh, there he goes. Sorry. It happened. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Poor Tim. It's busy down there on the panhandle. <laughs> okay. Oh, heck, I don't even know where to start with this because there's so many great things. Let's start with hmm, 
favorite characters out of this movie. All right, we'll just go around. Let's start with AJ. Uh, any favorite characters you thought stood out in this movie? Um, the Greedy, obviously. He's like the hero of the piece. Uh, the creature itself, which we never actually get to see what it looks like when it's not trying to assimilate something. I, I like to see you know, where it was, its natural form, but other than that, yeah. Uh, the guy who was the head of the base who eventually shot the guy in the head at the beginning of the movie. Oh, through. I'm trying to remember his name too. That's what's bad. There, there's so many guys in this movie. Yeah, it's, it's a sausage fest. Was it Cooper? Cooper, I think it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Cooper was the doc. No, no, no. The doc was the doc. <laughs> doc was <cool. laughs> no, the doc was Blair, played by Wilford Brimley. Okay, well, well, we got uh, any more, AJ, or? Okay, well, we got Tim back here. Tim, favorite characters in the movie? Oh, wow. Characters, huh? I, I, I guess the McCready character, I suppose. I mean, he's the lead, isn't he? Um, uh, again, it's a, like you said, it's a sausage fest. I, there's, no, there's no females in this movie at all. <laughs> yeah, unless the thing happens to be of that gender, but I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a good cast though. It's a very good cast. P pretty much a cast of nobodies, I suppose, except for maybe Kurt Russell at the time, anyway. But yeah. All righty, uh, William. Well, besides Kurt Russell, because of course he's the, he's the, one of the main actors. You got um, Wilfred Blimley, who's Blair. He stood out, um, and uh, uh, also at. Um, even though um, you know you, you don't show him that much, but near the end you see him a lot. You got a uh, um, what's his name? Uh, shoot, 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 shoot. Charles, 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 Charles. Charles played by Keith David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keith David. It was yeah. Funny because we see him again later on in the uh, the Roddy Piper movie. Yes, they live. It's yeah, good, uh, and of yeah. course all the actors, all the actors that turn out to be the one of the things. They all stood out because when you see it from complete, completely, you realize what each one of those characters was trying to do to the other humans. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Child mm -hmm. Play by Keith David. Yeah, he pops up again like, uh, in uh, Boy Called. Yeah, They Live, plus a couple other different movies. Mm -hmm. um, me, I thought Clark was a creepy-ass guy played by Richard Masser. And it's, it's weird how many different roles he's popped in up, up over the years. And I don't recognize him till later. It's like, <laughs> uh, oh, I know that guy. Wait a minute. Okay, BJ, favorite characters in this movie. Uh, which ones do you think stood out? Well, my favorite characters. Well, my, I could name one, one of them uh, right off the bat. It's Kurt Russell's character, hands down. I, lo I absolutely love his character in this. Um, then... Uh, Besides him, I would have to say um, uh, well, well, I, I actually, uh, yeah, there's, um, I, I honestly, I, I can't think of anyone else. So I guess it'd be Kurt Russell's character. Okay. You're gonna stick with McCready then. All right. Uh, next up, Philip. Well, obviously, as everybody says, um, Kurt Russell's McCready, McCready character stands out totally. I did like the doc. Uh, is it Blair? Who, who's the doctor? Yeah, played by Wilfred Brimley. Yeah, I did like his character a lot because he was, he, he, you know, especially when he went uh, not crazy, smashing things up and everything because he's afraid that, you know, they're going to get him and he wants to try and, um, you know, contain him. Right. That was his way of preventing that that thing from getting diabetes, off base. Diabetes, diabetes, yeah, but I like how he was so diabetes. badass in, in his own little way. So yeah, he's another character that stood out for me. Yeah, not he's to say, yeah, enough to say that everybody else, everybody else in that had their uh, certain char charismatic thing about them. Yeah. I just love the fact that Blair was the only one on planet Earth in 1982 who had a computer that had enough artificial intelligence to tell him this is a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, other than the chess computer, who's by the way voiced by Adrian Barbo, which I thought. Was <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
yeah, his computer can sit there and tell you if it gets to land, everybody's going to be infected within such and such a time. And I'm like, my God, what are you running there? It's like my Commodore 64 couldn't even add, you know, let alone do anything. <laughs> <laughs> 27,000 hours, which is three years and one month. Yeah. Wow. 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 We will. I had a lot of free time to calculate that. <laughs> I would have thought it would be quicker than that. Did you think it would have been quicker than that? Well, you got to remember the size of the planet. Land masses are spread out. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's starting from Antarctica, so that's why it's going to take time to get to any mainland. Yeah. yeah. Plus, it's got to as well. It's cover and yeah. Well, this but this story took place over what? A couple of days, three days, four days tops. A couple of days. Yeah. I would have thought so. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go for favorite parts. Uh, let's start with Tim uh, again, so we you know, in case he gets called away. Uh, what were your favorite parts of this particular movie? It, it's hard to pick. This is such an awesome flick. It's uh, very well made, very well paced. Uh, so it's hard really to pick a favorite part because once it's one of those movies that has a slow build up, but once it gets gets going, the bodies start piling up and it's just wow. So I mean, it's really hard. But I'm guessing probably that scene that the, uh, where where they have to test the blood. I suppose that's pretty that's pretty freaked out because it's it's full of surprises, isn't it? Like I mean, you don't expect that to happen. So. Oh, okay. BJ, favorite parts of the movie? Uh, I would have to say my my favorite parts of the movie would have to be the um, the uh, the CPR scene, like like when oh. the, uh, the, the defibrillator. Yeah. yeah, like when they go. To, Put CPR on the on the guy, and and then he becomes like the, the one of the things, and a, like a, a, the thing becomes like a spider in a sense. Yes, that's, about cool. And that's yeah. like that, that's one of my favorite scenes, and the blood test scene, as Tim here said as well. So, yeah, like the uh, and I would and I. I think also the cut Russell speech at when that everyone's outside and he and cut Russell saying like I'm human and uh, most of you are human and everything so uh, I guess like those scenes are mostly my favorite scenes yeah speaking of that look oh man <laughs> if you notice in the, you notice in the bottom part he has that little walking head on the bottom yeah. Oh man, there it is. Oh, oh grotesque. I know. I love that. I love these things. And McFarland does a great job with these things. And oh, okay. Let's move on to Philip. Favorite parts of the movie? Well, as um, BJ said, the, the, I remember when I originally watched this movie way back when the bit where the, the head crawls away like a spider. That shit. Oh, I can't say that word. That, that creeped me out so badly because I was like, oh, a walking head. And also the scene in the dog pen when the dogs are being attacked by the creature. That is disturbing. And that's one of my favorite scenes as well. Um, but overall, the whole movie, is, it hits the ground running and there's lots of great scenes, but I can't name them all. So, you know, those are my two main standouts. Okay, AJ, uh, what were your favorite parts of this movie? Um, all the gory bits where every part of a person sort of transforms into another part of the thing and it separates and goes off to try and procreate with other people. Um, the part at the beginning where the guy drops a live hand grenade and tries to dig for it in the snow. I yeah. Know, if it was me, I would have run. Um, why did Kurt Russell have ice cubes? In a bucket. He's in the Antarctic. Just go outside and snap a few icicles. <laughs> I know that's another thing. Why would you even need uh, y'all to have a freezer in the Antarctic for crying out loud? <laughs> it's like just uh, throw it outside. <laughs> I, I, I could easily see how this movie sort of uh, inspired Silent Hill and Resident Evil. Just the look at the creatures in the movie. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, and oh, hang on, let me, well, for the heck of it, we'll um, show the deleted scene again just for craps and giggles. Um. <laughs> this was the uh, stop motion animated sequence of the big one.
Yeah. You saying that to Jimmy Eat's team, but that was in, that was part of the movie. Not, not, all, not, not all of it was cut out, just like the yeah. they just the, they were supposed to intermix another scene. Um hang on, let's go ahead and bring this up real quick. Um that's the uh, Blair creature. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Why do you suppose that they still had the dog element in it? That's a good question. I don't know why they went that route, but it was because remember when when he was doing the uh, autopsy on the dog, on the fr- on the on the dog from the kettle, he touched it, so some of that DNA was on his hands. Oh, okay, yeah. And then, and then of course later on, when you saw him grab the 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 officer, he grabbed his face. He had the human DNA added to him. Oh hmm. yeah. Also, yeah, there was also a couple of different endings of this movie. Um, one of, yeah, one of them would show shows the dog running off, and then it turns around, and you see the the smoke of the camp coming up, and then you see a helicopter coming in, and then there's this little ending narration. And that yeah, was, they, they had to cut it out because if you notice, Blair when when he went nuts, he killed all the dogs in the kennel. Yeah, the, the, they're, implying, they're implying the dog was the thing escaping. So that, maybe that's why they went with the, the dog sticking out. They're just trying to show something for later, where you know it's you know the, it still has the ability to go back into a dog if it needed. And that's what you know they're saving that for that ending. But they didn't use it. Also, there was a quote unquote happy ending, which has not been released to this day, um, where they have a helicopter rescue land. They find McCready. They don't mention Childs in the description I found, and they give him a blood test, and he's still human. But, um, but yeah, then they just decided to cut it because he thought it was too light of a way you know, to end that particular story. I yeah. like the way they ended it. With, it's yeah. ambiguous. You don't know. Yeah. You don't know what happens. Exactly. Well, I was going to say well, that. The clues, just... the, the clues are there. Whether um, Charles is an alien or not. Um, but we get to that after we get the uh, all of us finished answering um, Freedom's question. Oh no! Tell me now, man. Oh, go ahead, okay, go. go ahead. Why not? Okay. Um. Okay. When the um. When you notice and um, you notice me when um McReady and the other two went out to give Blair the test. Yeah. Um, Child is wearing a navy blue jacket, and he had a gun on him, and you see right. other coats. You see other coats hanging on the rack, and then the camera pans, and you see down the basement. You don't see nobody coming in and out, but you, the camera points to it, and then when uh, McReady finds the hole. And there was a, and Blair was making the ship, and he blows it up. He heads back. All of a sudden, you see Charles was running off, and he claiming that he went after Blair. But in reality, when he meets McReady again, he's not wearing a navy blue jacket. He's wearing another jacket because, as McReady says on tape, when the thing jumps on you, the what you are wearing is is dirty and and ripped apart. That's, <gasps> why, that's why in the movie, on if you notice. The very first scene when the dog goes in the room and you only see a, a silhouette of somebody's shadow, we yeah. know who it is. His his clothes is changed, and the guy in the the, the guy in the roller skates he said, "Which one of you nasty guys do your drawers in my garbage can?" That's the scene that the thing is attacking people at nighttime when they when they're in bed. So every oh. and, then, and then the thing when the thing is already changed, he goes after a human saying, "Hey, where you been? Where you been?" So they could, they could look at that other person, and then we had it there. That's a come you always see um, 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 windows getting looked at, and then Charles is looking at McReady like that. They always the names their names are popping out because they're still human. So the things are getting them. So at the end, yes, Charles did get caught, and McReady gave him the test that he did in the beginning when he played chess. Remember, he he threw the uh, when he lost, he threw the liquor. Because Charles is such a German phobe because when they gave the lab test and he passed, he said, get me out of here. He, he didn't want to be near the other guy that he thought was contaminated. So McReady gave him the liquor and he drank it straight out without thinking. So he said, that's why McReady was laughing. He said, he just failed a, a quick chess move and he's a, he's a thing. Um, I, I, I would say that's probably reading a little too much into it, though. <laughs> Well, well, it makes sense. No, no, no but it makes sense in a way. Yeah, it does. No, it's a good theory, but I think that that that's a, a possibility. Like you said, there's already been two other possible endings. The ending no, but, they no, that's the ending. But remember, like like Freedom said, the happy ending had they were testing McReady, but you never found Charles. No, but I, I think after, after McReady gave him the liquor and he noticed it, 
he would have burned them right there. And I think, those, but I think that's a good possible theory. But I think I think the the, the episode ending he went with the director Carpenter he, he implies that it's an ambiguous ending. You don't know if one of them is infected. The, the, the movie just ends there. I think yeah, it ends like that. But when you really go back, you see Charles in that navy blue thing, and then when he meets McReady again. He's wearing a different jacket altogether. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, that's that, yeah, that, totally that means the Blair came out of the basement and, and dragged them down. Mm-hmm. That's a very good spot, bro. Well done, dude. No, I just thought for a second, you know, when Blair was turning into the creature, he was about, you know, just, he's just going to, this is what happens diabetes, when you get diabetes. Diabetes. diabetes, diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that, that, uh, that ticked me off is the, um, the one that was in the roller skates, he was in the basement too. We never see what happened to him. Mm. It's, mm. It, it, we, we, call, we know Blair got him, but it, that scene was never shown. I think it's in the, um, the special edition DVD, the, those, those scenes. Yeah, where okay. he reaches and he grabs that dude and his fingers just sink into his face. and she, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I'm talking about the, <laughs> other, um, the, um, the other one that was, that was, uh, the cook oh. that was the cook that was there too. Yeah, he just disappears. Yeah, yeah see, you only see him disappearing. But I'm, gu- I'm guessing he, 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 the Carpenter probably tried several different edits before he came up with the way he wanted it to be, I'm guessing. So you, you're probably, your theory is probably correct. That's probably where they were going with it. But the, it, the, the movie as it is now, though, you don't really see that unless you're paying attention to the details, like you just said. I mean, because yeah. the ending is deliberately ambiguous. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I ask, um, the, because they decided the spaceship, was there more than one um, alien occupant in that? Because it's a, it's a huge spaceship for one alien creature well you got to remember that um it doesn't have a specific shape um it must have just looked big when it came out of the ship and it got frozen and then it started mm-hmm. taking shape of anything you touch it like the dog and the humans like that yeah it, it's scary too because if you go and watch the documentary and all that the um the one lady who helped design the model and all that she still has it yeah and, well, you gotta remember, remember that this is based on the book who goes there yeah. And the book, mm. it, never, it never, it always says that it could change shape. It doesn't yeah, have a specific look. Yeah, the actual one they used for the filming model and all that, it actually did light up and all that. They used, uh, I think it was copper brass as well as uh, resin and all that in it. And it's very, very highly detailed. She has it in her office on a mount. And when she, she has a battery pack rig to it. And when she hits the button, the little saucer lights still come on and all that. And I, I thought that was awesome <laughs> that this thing still exists. That little piece of it, well, for, it was the model they used for the beginning sequence where they show the saucer coming in and crashing, mm-hmm. um, and she went into such detail on that. It's amazing, man, just to look at. Plus, the matte paintings that they used were incredible. A lot of the stuff they did for, like, when they went down to the alien ship and they're standing there looking down on it, all, that was all matte paintings. Yeah, I could see. And at the time, yeah, I remember because I remember by the time of the documentary, the artist who did them, oh, I wish I remember his name off the top of my head. Mike um, Plunk, he do some of it. Yeah, he he. You well, know, I he think do, he do yeah. this. Like, hold on, I don't need to see it. Yeah. See the head. Yeah. yeah. He drew that, and then the final scene, he drew some pictures. Hold on. Was it the same guy who did the uh, the matte paintings for the movie? No, there was another guy. See, they said Mike Mike Plunk did a lot of horror comics, so he did a lot of the different looks of the thing. Concept or uh, drawings. Ah, uh, okay. Let me see. Also, the final screenplay for this movie was written in 81 by Bill Lancaster. Anyone know the significance of that? No. Didn't he write um, um, bu- 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 um, Bad News Bears? He was the son of Burt Lancaster. Ooh. That's what That's he did. Now okay. you know how he got the job. <laughs> I think Matter of fact. Guy, I think, didn't he write Bad News Bears, the first one? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's been a long time. Uh, wasn't it? Wasn't he in that movie? Oh, I can't remember. Oh, it's been a long time since I watched Bad News Bears and all that. Man. Uh. Okay. Anything else anyone want to bring up while we're on it? Well, um, um, we're gonna have to nitpick the 2011 um, prequel. Oh boy! <laughs> because of, of uh, they did a good job. I mean, the movie by itself is good. But since they made it a prequel, they made some errors on it. Well, we gotta remember. We gotta remember. McReady and the team went went to the base two times, two times. 
And the okay. trip takes an hour each way. So okay. during those two trips, what happened to the chick from the prequel? She she's probably dead. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that should have been a body that could have found. It could be. The way it seemed. That's the thing. We don't know if they packed up into that snowcat and made a run for it. Yeah, and because the mistake was um the prequel of the discovery of the UFO, they made it like they found it in a cave. While in the competent one, they showed the videotapes of the Norwegians finding the, the ship and then using explosive. Yeah, the yeah. explosive to get it out and all that. So that was a big that was a big mistake. They yeah, they did. blew it out with thermite, and yeah, that, yeah. that was a big mistake there. Yeah, but, but you got to remember, we're talking about two movies that were made twenty nine years apart. But yeah. what, and of but, course, the big stink about the split face. Yeah. Also, no, I don't see a mistake there at all. Yeah, you know, just because they pulled out one set of organs doesn't mean a thing. You got to remember, for one, the doc um, who was Blair, he wasn't a trained forensic scientist. You remember, this is a guy who was sent with along with an Antarctic expedition to keep these guys. Basically, if you broke a bone or your nose started bleeding, he was there to patch you up, and that was about it. You know, yeah. yeah. But uh, the only thing about it is this: is the the competent one made the thing very um, stealthy. <laughs> Didn't want to reveal itself. And then in this one, it made it. Um, the prequel made it when it became the split face. It started attacking everybody, and, and instead of trying to escape and hide. Well, I take it as an instance of the thing was able to learn. You yeah. see. Well, oh, and, yeah. the, and of course, the ice. When McReady and um, Doc found the big block of ice where the thing came from, yeah. the prequel made the mistake of the thing. He blew right out of the iceberg and, and broke it. So I'm saying if he did that, there would be no block of ice for him ready to find. Yeah, but I... Yeah, I but, oh, go ahead, Phil. You're going. No, no, no. no get, carry on, carry on, carry on. No, I, was, I look at it this way. Um, the, the, thing, the, the thing in the first movie had just... This is its first experiences with human beings. So what happened was it learned with what had happened to the Norwegian base that it can't underestimate them, and that's why it took the stealth approach with the American guys who yeah. found it later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree with but that. But that block of ice is a big mistake there. I mean, they did uh, they did good with the axe on the door and all that. The prequel that McReady's team finds. I mean, they kept that intact. But that one block of ice scene no, that McReady finds it doesn't exist in the prequel because he blew out of it. There was no ice left over. Okay, go on ahead, AJ. I was gonna say because he drilled through the ice, there would be a, a weak point in the ice. So you could still technically blow the top out of the ice, and the rest of it would be intact. No, no, he no. In the prequel, he he went through the whole block of ice. There was no ice left on the floor. Yes, there, there was, was. No, not that much of it. Not, not, not the way McReady found it. Not that size. It was small oh. chunks. Yeah. Unless it was, unless it was a secondary um, creature found in the no, ice. Don't say like that. Said, yeah, that makes no. Nah, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, like, like I said, the spaceship's too big for one creature. There must be more than one of those knocking it's about. A prisoner, though, or a genetic. Um, Experiment. Why would evolution create a creature that does what it did? Uh, Remember, yeah, it, comes, it comes from another, another, it comes from another planet like that. Yeah, it came from another planet. I, I understand that. I'm just saying, why would it create something that's just gonna to be a, a parasite just to consume and spread like a virus? But remember, it's also intelligent because when, when it was Blair, it was making another UFO yeah. down in the. Yeah, it was creating one using yeah. parts of the helicopter and all that stuff. Yeah. All right. Another nifty thing was the fact that the soundtrack for this one wasn't done by John Carpenter. He he did. Nope. It was done by a fellow named Ennio Maricone or Maricone, something like that. So it was mm -hmm. one of the first. It was one of the few times he actually brought someone in, you know, to do the soundtrack for him. Plus, um, all of the creature effects in this movie were done by Rob Botton, with the exception of one: the dog creature. Oh. Um, the late um, he did Terminator and Aliens. Um, the late great Stan Winston. There you go. Yep. Yeah, he was brought in on this movie to help out, and it's just you know when you go back and watch this movie, you, and, and you you know it's like when you live in this age and you go back and watch the movie, you think oh, that's nothing. But then when you grew up and you knew, wait a minute. They didn't have CGI and all that back then. They had to actually physically make all this stuff. 
and a lot of times you didn't get a retake or anything like that. You had to literally get it right the first time. Otherwise, you had to go back and take hours to reset everything, clean anything up, and start it all over again. And that's why that's the kind of effort I really appreciate in these movies. You know, you just can't you know restart the computer program <laughs> or add it in exactly. later screen or you know you just you know back then they didn't have access to any of that. That's why I think really makes these movies stand out was all the effort that went into it. Yeah, uh, and plus. Plus, then it also helps the actors to work against something that's there, actually there. And it gives them extra impetus to work with it, yeah. Rather than all the CGI where you're working to nothing and it's not really, you know, doesn't come across well. Well, not only that, it it hasn't aged badly at all. It still looks very well, very good Mm -hmm. for a 30 plus year old movie. You you know what's funny? Like Freedom said in the beginning of this, that this movie came out two weeks after E.T. and at the same week as Blade Runner. But I will see this movie more than the other two. I will rewatch it more than the other two movies. Plus, yeah, yeah. I, can, yeah. No, I just wanted to throw in. Plus, you had to remember, um, Blade Runner had Ridley Scott behind it, and you know he was still a big name around at that time. And maybe that's one of the reasons why you know it got lost. Because this is back in Carpenter's early days when he was just starting to get his name out there, and yeah. Okay, I'm about to blow BJ's mind. The quote-unquote defibrillation scene. Guess how they did it, BJ? Uh, how? Very interesting. <laughs> what happened was um, they actually brought in a, a young man who was a double amputee. Both of his arms had been cut off, I think, in, a, in an industrial accident below the, around the elbow. So what they did was they fitted him with prosthetic ends and when you see the part where uh, the guy's pulling away from the chest with his arms cut off, that's that guy. And all they did was they took a latex mask of the actual actor and put it over his face. <laughs> cool. Uh, that's why that scene goes really, really quickly because. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, that's no, how, it's been, broken. It's that's how they did it. No computer effects back then. They didn't have really? computer effects and stuff like that back then. Really? So, what? Wow. And that's how they did it. So that was real, BJ. What you saw there was actually happening. Yep. So the, yeah, the arms that got cut off inside the creature were fake. Yeah. Oh, and when the guy pulled back, that was the actual amputee with a rubber mask over his face. And that's why they shot the scene the way they did, so you couldn't get a good look at the guy's face. And it went really quickly, because otherwise you'd have tell this is the guy in a rubber mask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> Plus, um, a lot of people don't realize the opening titles for the movie were not animated. The guy actually took a fish tank and he had to put this black cellophane like material in it and he etched out the parts where the you know, the le- were for the letters the thing. Then he puts a backlight on it, fills it up with cigarette smoke. So yeah, they're sitting there chugging away and blowing into this tube that goes into the tank and filled it up with cigarette smoke. Then they put a camera in front of it, and then they had a mechanism in there where they torched off the material, that the, the, the flammable material, on the back of the, the, black, the black wall, and it actually burns away to reveal the letters with the spotlight illuminating them from behind with the smoke. And that's how they did it. Cool, isn't it? That's weird. All right, in the opening... Did they- what? You, all right, all right, the opening of the movie where you see the letters of the thing come raggedly appearing? Yes. Not, wait, no. They did, That's they, how they did it. That's how they did it. I'm not joking with you. This is actually fact, man. Did they repeat uh, that in the um, – did they, did, they, did they repeat that with the um, 2001? Um, 11. 11. 2011. Yeah. Did they I, don't repeat they, I don't know if they repeated or used computer. No, uh, the 2011 they used computer as far as I know. Okay. Uh, um, it took him hours to do that. Plus, um, he didn't get right. It didn't burn out right the first like few times. He had to do it. Oh, heck, at least I can't remember how many times. He didn't get it right the first shot because he was making remarks about that because then he had to go back, reset it, and start all over again like four or five times, something like that, before he got the effect he wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the guy who did the effects of the, of the thing – uh, he's best remembered for for two effects. That was one was the howling, when the transformation yeah. was done, and of course the the purple wedding scene from uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, okay. He, I didn't he, know he was he did, Yeah, yeah, he did that. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Okay. Anything else anyone want to throw in? I want. To, I want to know um, uh, uh, what happened. Did any? They should have made a some sort of sequel where because um, no one really touched the um, the spaceship. It just it's still there. As far as I understood it, it's still there in the ice, and no one's really gone into it to um, take any technology and reverse engineer it and all that. And then, well, in the way they did, they did some certain sequels to it. One was a video game, and another one was a thing like a bunch of comic books. But um, but I don't think that exact sequels are like alternate universes like that. Any sequel you would have made to a film like this would have just been repetitive. It would have been the same thing over again, different yeah, groups. Sure. Stuff and, yeah. and so there's no yeah, point no, really. I don't, I don't think yeah. I don't think like a movie like this a like a the thing it, it shouldn't be a sequel. It, it oh, mama, be. this is Compton's way of um his trilogy of uh, apocalyptic movies because after this one, his next one will be um Prince of Darkness, and then the other one is um in the Mouth of Madness of, about yes. apocalyptic movies. All right, AJ, you wanted to throw something in? Yeah, uh, Kurt Russell's hat, the Prospector hat, that had to die. It was terrible. By the way, um, to solve the mystery about the 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 blood who had the keys to it, um, the answer was right there in the movie. Um, it was the, uh, uh, what's his name? Windows. When he went back and he saw this guy being attacked and he ran to get help, he had yeah, the, the key done and he dropped it. You hear it hitting the floor. Yeah. He yeah, forgot yeah. him, so the thing had the keys to get to the blood bag. That solved that riddle who had the keys. Ah. Oh. That was Windows' fault. But yeah. the dumb officer who had the keys originally didn't remember that. But he remember he said, I haven't seen it in two or three days. I haven't used it. Yeah. The thing that intrigues me most though about this whole movie, you went 90-odd minutes, and yet, what the hell were these guys up there researching to begin with? That's true. <laughs> yeah, you never know that. Yeah. See, that's what I love about Carpenter's movies. It's simple, it's straight, it's to the point. It follows the classic KISS formula. Keep it simple and stupid. And just, just go right in there. Tell the story. Don't get overcomplicated with explanations for unnecessary stuff. Okay, uh, you know, that's what I love about Carpenter's movies. He's just direct, you know? Yeah. You got a bunch of every old guys, you know, once again, we're going with almost like an every man formula. You're thrown into this situation and they got to make best with what they got, you know? And plus it's kind of like almost out of an old like mystery novel because you never really know who the hell's who you don't know. Who's the thing. Who's not. Yeah. And, it's a good, that's, that's the way it is in the book. Who goes there? It's really like a mystery. There are more people on the base in the book. So, you know, so like there's they're like 50 of them. So you got a lot of killings going on in the book, Man, especially, especially with the dogs because two escape that's not in the movie and they have to chase them down and destroy them. Yeah, it wasn't until a few years later because I didn't get introduced to a certain show until around 1983 that I, I sat down and watched this movie again on VHS and I'm like, okay, when's the doctor showing up? <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those type of situations except you know i don't think they'd show it on the yeah. bbc you know oh man okay anything else anyone want to throw in it's a movie that tests that uh even after 30 years it's, everybody still see it and talk about it yeah that's why well and I, I would think that this is a, probably my favorite out of John Cop in the films. I love this movie. This movie has stood the test of time. It's still talked about to this day. Same thing with a lot of Carpenter's films. Yeah, he should, he's had a few misses here and there. Oh, we won't bring up the misses. <laughs> but, but you're right. It's, it still looks good today. I mean, this many years on, it looks really good. I mean, it, it hasn't aged badly at all. I mean... And it's a classic. It's a perfect classic horror film. I mean, it's paced. The pace of it is brilliant. I mean, because it it doesn't you know waste a lot of time. The story, the ball gets rolling right from the start, and boom! Before you know it, everybody's dead. There, there, you're done. <laughs> so, great movie. Mm -hmm. I'm just glad we went 90 minutes without good old Doc Blair trying to sell us some Quaker Oats. <laughs> <laughs> I remember having those commercials. Yeah. <laughs> do we think? Do we think that a prequel was absolutely necessary? No. 
me when it first I first heard word about this going to happen, I'm like, no, don't do this because the first talks that came out were like, we're going to do a sequel, and I'm like, no, no, don't do it. Then they go, we're going to do a prequel. I'm like, still, no, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> then I sat down and watched it. I wouldn't discourage anyone from watching the thing prequel. It's not bad flick. You know, I actually, you know, uh, who here's watched it and you know, liked it or has anything to say about it? Uh, AJ, what do you want to say about the 2011? It was a, it was a brilliant movie. They had little plot uh, failings, like the videotape and whatnot here and there, and uh, the, how the spacecraft was on Earth. But other than that, it was still a pretty good story. All right. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a good movie of by itself. By making it by, by making it a sequel to the competent one, you, you notice the uh, the few of the flaws that's in it. But by itself, it's a good movie. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Tim, did you want to weigh in? Did you see the twenty eleven one? Yeah, I watched it last year for the first time because I didn't know about it. But um, I, 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 it's not a bad movie. It's just got a hard job to do because it's got to be as entertaining as the other one, and still build up to that one. Uh, and it, I love the way it ends where that movie starts with the dog running in the snow. I mean, I thought that was in the same music pumping in, yeah, but, yeah. uh, but again, it's, it's not nearly as entertaining because of that. You know, it's got, an, in other words, watching this movie, you know, the inevitable ending of it, which makes it a hard sell. Whereas watching the thing for the first time, you don't know what the hell you're looking at. All right. BJ, do you see the 2011 one? Nope. I, I didn't. I, I, I got, I have it on my Netflix request of of watching it because uh, I just want I I'm I'm actually curious to see how it is. So, but um, from from most of you say like if it like it's a decent film, I I I'll probably take a look at it. Yeah, it's it's not bad. I enjoyed it. I said I, I'll be honest with you, it was on a five dollar bin. I, that's where I found it. But uh, still, I I you know I gave it a good look over and I really enjoyed it. It's not a bad flick. Okay, anything else for me? Just to be clear, though, it, it's not a remake, though, right? No, it, it takes place at before. Matter of fact, the end of the movie is the dog running away in the snow with the helicopter chasing it. So, so it is a prequel. Yeah, it goes. Yeah. And you even hear the same music playing from the beginning of the original movie. Yeah. Okay. Good. So you'll really enjoy it. It's, it's pretty good. All right. Okay, well, if no one else has anything to say, let's go ahead and rate this sucker. All right, let's start with Philip out of 10. How do you rate the thing? Because for, 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 for the time it was made and for the way it, it was done, I'm giving it a whopping great big 10 because it's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, for, the, for the actors and for, and for the creation of the creature and how they make it re realize it all. Whopping 10. Okay, AJ. Yep, same for me. Massive 10. All right, BJ, do I have to ask? <laughs> no, you don't. It is a 10. John Copper does the thing is a 10. All right, Texas Tim. Yeah, it's an easy 10. This is always going to be on my top 10 horror movies list, so easy 10. All right, William? Yeah, this is my favorite John Copper movie. It gets a 10. Considering a movie that was made over 30 years ago, it still stands the test of time with effects, drama, and mystery. It, it, it will always last. It, it, should, it should be one of those movies conserved in the, in the, in the, in the, in the House of Congress right there with, with the other films. Oh, there's a movie out there. There's a uh, Facebook page. Matter of fact, they told me to link this podcast to it when I'm done. That's, uh, that's trying to get the thing put into the uh, the archives. Here you go. And myself, come on, it's an easy one. 10 out of 10. Yeah, I still remember scenes from this movie 33 years later, you know, after it came out. Like I said, I, I still remember that scene vividly when they show that tiny little clip on the freaking prize movie on Channel 43 here in the area. <laughs> Unfortunately, it makes me remind, you know, remember John Lanigan's male afro or whatever that thing was he had on his head. But oh well. Uh, okay, well, next week. Uh, this one's going to be a fun one. We're going to take a little trip down to the village. Next week, John Carpenter's Village 
of the damned. Oh, oh, I love that. Oh, which one? Which version? Oh, hang on. John Carpenter's. John Carpenter's with Chris Reeve. Oh, Chris Reeve one. Oh, I'm more used. I'm more. I'm more used to the one, the, the older one. The, 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 isn't there a previous yeah, you know, one? There is the original one. We're gonna talk about that one too. Yep. Okay. Cool. Cool. And and the book is based on. Also, anyone here remember who played the priest in that movie? Mark oh, Hamill. Mark Hamill. Mark, Mark Hamill. Hamill. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Which movie? Oh, Village, yes, Village of the, the Dam. Hmm. Next week's oh, movie. Oh, never seen that yeah. one. Matter of fact, uh, one of Chris Reeves' last movies before he, you know, suffered that uh, accident. Yeah. yeah. I and think you remember that one. I think you remember. One hell of a performance in this movie. You've you got to hand it to him. He's really, really good in it. And it's really, as a matter of fact, Kirstie Alley back when she was fading away from hot. <laughs> she yes. was definitely on the downside. Yeah, she was. But you know, yeah, like I said, Chris Reeves one of the things that stands out in that movie. You know, he, you know, he really plus Mark Hamill is the priest does a really good job in it. Um, so you kind of get a chance to see him other than that certain star franchise. You know, <laughs> but, mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. The book, well, the book was originally called Midrich Cuckoos. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. John uh, Wyndham wrote it. Yeah. Let's go around and get goodbyes from everyone. Let's start with Tim. As always, thanks for having me. Great talking to you guys about a great film. All right, BJ. Yes, I'm always glad to be here. I'll, I'll be happy to do any of the Oh My God Files whenever. So, bye, everybody. Bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, Philip. Great podcast. And next week... I'll see you in the village. All right, AJ. Good welcome down under, and I'll see you in the village next week as well. Okay, William. Um, thank you for having me here, and I can't wait to meet you next week in the village. Okay, so until then, guys, see you in the village. Take it easy. Why, <laughs> 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 <laughs>